you guys, it's Landon Blake from Redefined Horizons, and this is the second supplemental video I'm doing on Chapter 2 of Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles. So in this uh, supplemental video, I want to talk about the difference between a boundary line and a property line. I had always used those two terms interchangeably, and upon rereading Brown's Chapter 2 after 20 years, I realized that I should... Uh, not be using those terms interchangeably. In other words, not swapping them without much thought. So, uh, Browns makes an excellent point in Chapter 2. I'm glad I reread it, and he points out the difference in those two terms. And I understood that these two things were different. I just didn't understand uh, the distinction between how those uh, that these two things could be, two types of lines could be identified by those two terms, property line and boundary line. So, I'm going to try and explain that in the video, and I'm going to be more disciplined about how I use those terms moving forward. So in this situation, if you watch the first video, we got the same block, a uh, little bit different scenario here. So we've got our original center line mons and we've got our original block corner mons. And in this scenario, Mr. Blake buys lot one, two, and five and six. And Mr. Cono buys lot three, four, seven, and eight. So they split the block in half. Okay, and here's what happens. So the record measurements of the block um, are 600 feet. So the, the record length of this block is 12, 1,200 feet. Don't worry about the height. We're not going to talk about that. We're only worried about in the east-west direction. North is up. So the, the block is 1,200 feet wide. Okay. So per record, Mr. Blake would own the west 600 feet of the block, and Mr. Cano would own the east 600 feet of the block. Now, Mr. Cano decides to build first. Okay, so this is vacant land. Mr. Cano comes out. He's going to build, right? And he hires uh, Mr. Hart to do his survey. And Mr. Hart's a new surveyor. He doesn't really know what he's doing. And so what Mr. Hart does is he finds these two monuments. He sets up on this one. He backsites this one. He turns 90 degrees. And he just stakes out the deed measurement. Okay, so the measurement record measurement on the map. So he stakes out 600 feet. Comes down here, sets a wood hub. Then Mr. Hart comes down here. He occupies this block corner. He backsites this block corner, turns 90. Comes down the record 600 feet, sets a hub here. Mr. Cano sets up a string line on those two hubs. And he puts in a block wall. Okay, right here. At 600 feet from these two corners. Okay. Now, a little bit later on, another survey is done. And it reveals that the block is not actually 1,200 feet long. It's only 1,190, I should actually say six. Sorry about that. 1,196 feet long. Let's fix that. All right, sorry about that, guys. 1,196 feet long. So there's four foot of shortage in the block. Now, you got to remember when Mr. Cano got his survey... Mr. Blake hadn't done anything with his property yet, and Mr. Connell came in, he hired Mr. Hart, and Mr. Hart just came over here 600 feet when he should have only come over 598 feet, but he didn't. He came over 600 feet. Okay, even though Mr. Connell's deed said lot three, lot four, lot seven, and lot eight, Mr. Hart, because he didn't know what he was doing, came over the 600 feet. In other words, he didn't prorate between the found original monuments. That's what surveyors call that. So he should have come over 598. He didn't. He came over 600 feet. So he took an extra two feet of his neighbor's property. Okay. And he built his block wall. And that block wall has been in for 50 years. Okay. Now, in most places, Mr. Cano will acquire unwritten rights to this. Okay. Now, it gets a little bit tricky because Mr. Cano has to prove that he paid taxes on this, but let's just say that he put a building here on lot 4 and 8, and lot 3 and lot 7 is a parking lot, and the parking lot goes over to the block wall, and the taxer says, sir, says that he based the taxes, the assessed value on which Mr. Cano pays taxes, on the physical improvements of the wall and the parking lot. All right, well then, Mr. Cano is going to be able to prove that he paid the taxes, and he's occupied it, it's been open, notorious, hostile, all the, the various aspects under the law. So let's say he acquires this by unwritten rights. Okay, adverse possession. I'll give you another scenario. Maybe 
Mr. Blake, because he's such a great guy and super reasonable, and Mr. Cano, they're not really sure where this dividing line is because these wood hubs that got set by Mr. Hart are gone and these these corners were never set on the original survey. And Mr. Plague is just a good guy and he really likes Mr. Uh, Mr. Cano and Mr. Cano's kids, play with his kids and, you know, whatever. So he tells him, hey, don't worry about it. Um, we'll just agree that the block walls are boundary. That's called boundary by agreement. Okay. And so either way, whether through boundary by agreement or through adverse possession, and Mr. Brown also mentions estoppel in Chapter 2, which we're not going to get into. This gray area here between where the prop, where the boundary line would be per a proper survey and where the actual property line is, where the limits of ownership is, those are not the same. Okay, And this happens a lot. This happens a lot. Okay, So they're not the same. The boundary line is no longer the property line. The property line has moved to match the possession in this case. Okay, so I've got some labels that show that. So let's just talk about the three scenarios we have here in this setup with this block. So this purple line is a property line, okay? But it's never been a boundary line. In other words, it was never established on a survey, okay? It's a property line because it it is the limit of the property that's owned by Mr. Cano. It's the line, dividing line between the ownership of Mr. Cano and the ownership of Mr. Hart. But it was never established on a survey or by words in a deed. Right? So it is a property line, not a boundary line. This brown line over here is a boundary line because it was established on the original survey. Right? But it is no longer a property line. The property line has moved two feet to the west. Okay? Because of the ownership, the possession of, physical possession of this strip. Okay, so that's the second scenario. Okay, the third scenario is this green line here, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. These are both boundary lines and property lines. So they were boundaries that were laid out on the original survey, and they are also property lines. So the possession corresponds, possession and ownership correspond to the boundary on the green lines. Okay, so let's go over those again. Purple line is the property line. It's an ownership line. It's at the limit of the possession. Okay, It is not a boundary line because it was never put in on a survey, nor was it established by words in a deed. Okay? It was established by the possession and by the funky survey that, uh, you know, in the, one, in the one scenario, the funky survey that, that Surveyor Hart did. Okay, So it's not a, it's not a boundary line because it was never established on the original survey. Okay? You remember what we, what we said Mr. Hart did a retracement survey, and he didn't do a good job. So it's not a true boundary line because it wasn't established on the original controlling map. Okay, This brown line was established on the original controlling map, so it is a boundary line. Boundary lines last forever. That's what Browns tells us in Chapter 2. But it is no longer a property line. The property line has moved off the boundary line over two feet because of the erroneous survey and the block wall. And lastly, we have... These other lines on the outside of the block that are both boundary lines and property lines. In other words, the limits of ownership correspond to the, the surveyed lines, the lines per the original survey. Now, I'm not going to get super into detail on this, but you could have a different line. So let's just say that that uh, Mr. Cano decides he's going to come out here and landscape an extra four feet of the public right-of-way here. Okay, then what we could really have is a is another line. So I'll draw it in. Let me turn off my snap. Well, yeah, let's do it this way. So I'm going to just draw this in just so you guys can see it. So let's make it bright red so we can see it. So now we've got a different type of line. This is a line of possession. Okay, but unless something really funky could be shown, Mr. Cano can't get adverse possession over the public right of way. So this is a line of possession. It will never become a property line unless some special circumstances apply. And it's not a boundary line because it wasn't established on the original survey. So now, now we've got four types. We've got a property line. We've got a boundary line. we got 
lines that are both boundary and property lines. And now we've added another wrinkle. This is a line of possession. And it, and it will more than likely never become a property line because you can't adversely possess against the public. All right. And so these complications are why um, you don't survey, uh, you know, you shouldn't be doing boundary surveys unless you know what you're doing. And you should understand the differences between those terms and Browns. So hopefully these supplemental videos will help, guys, and, and uh, we'll, we'll do another video where I just walk through the study notes on Chapter 2 and talk about these uh, key concepts uh, a little more and, and kind of bundle them all together. So thanks for watching.